We are live. So, welcome to 2005's Flight Plan Review and Thoughts film. I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I do have a bit of a headache, but I'm going to try to still keep this fairly high energy. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review where, if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers, you can skip ahead, which is you need to lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And content warning and or trigger warning. I'm going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie, including kidnapping, gaslighting, and mental illness. Grieving. I guess grieving deserves its... yeah. Now, the MPAA rated this PG-13, and the video will be for those above that age. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. I streamed this and thus didn't pay any extra money to watch it, so anything negative I say in this vlog is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things that I send this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, I watched this, you know, a number of years ago, back when it was relatively new. I think it was 2007. So, I will be judging it based on when it came out, not today. As far as, you know, pacing and how how big it gets, but, you know, as far as what happens and such, because that has changed significantly in the time, in the years between. Now, let's see. Um, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say, during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, this is my second viewing. The first viewing was in 2007. And, yeah, this is one of those movies that I first watched years ago. For many years I didn't have access to it, and now I have access to it again. That's why I'm doing a video on it now. Otherwise, I would have done it years ago. But the last time I had access to it was before I was doing videos. It's not that I didn't want to do it in the 14 years that have passed. And uh, I watched it right before pressing record, so the movie is fresh in my mind. Plot. Recently widowed Kyle and her daughter Julia are flying from Berlin home to America with Kyle's deceased husband in a coffin in the plane. The plane takes off, Kyle dozes off and wakes up when the plane is still in midair. Julia is gone, and everyone she talks to says that they don't know anything about her having a girl with her. There's no record of her daughter boarding the plane. Is she losing her mind, or is something else going on? And this this has two taglines. This fall, one passenger is taking control to find the truth. If someone took everything you live for, how far would you go to get it back? And here are a few alternate titles suggested by my fellow critics. Panic Fuselage, Panic Room at 30,000 feet, Die Hard in a Plane, and a few short sentences that I quite like from, once again, my fellow critics. Absurdity has a new name, Flight Plan. How did this movie get made at all? Pure direct-to-video TV movie trash. I like how that manages to combine. I've never heard of a direct-to-video TV movie. As far as I know, it's one of the other. But both of those have quite a bad record, so combining them you know, presumably that amplifies just how bad it is. Just when you thought it would be safe to board airplanes again. 
And yeah, if this is something you've never heard of, this is a drama mystery thriller. The drama gets kind of sappy, the mystery does keep you guessing, and it is fairly thrilling. And yeah, it was it came out in 2005. And evidently Panic Room did not have enough room for all the panic that Jodie Foster wanted to act out as a mother protecting her daughter. Cuz last name is Pratt. Now it is spelled with two T's, but she acts like it's one T. Grieving is one of the most important things in life. Everybody will have to grieve the loss of a family member, a pet, at some point in their lives. And because of that, I think that it's extremely important how grieving is depicted in movies. And here, this movie kind of suggests that if you're grieving, you will turn into a panicked, anxious mess. Which can, you know, which could have the negative effect of scaring a lot of people when they see someone else grieving or when they realize that they themselves will have to grieve. I suppose it is possible that Kyle Pratt was a panicked, anxious mess before her husband died. Now, Drawfee recently discussed that maybe Marvel the Martian is actually unknowable and we've never seen his true form. So my suggestion is that the sci-fi slash Looney Tunes version of if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best, should be if you can't handle my true form, you don't deserve my Marvin the Martian. Now... Yes, so, according to IMDb's more like this list, this movie is like Panic Room No. Yeah, if you've watched both of these movies, that isn't surprising to you at all. I gave that movie a 7 out of 10. Phone Booth, an 8 out of 10, and the, the, um, yeah, you know, it's again trapped in a, in a single location, although phone booth is significantly smaller of a single location and you know dealing with this extreme stress it's been yeah compared to red eye seven out of ten which you know the the both of them are about someone you know a, a young woman on a plane who's really terrified and it's been compared to vantage point which, I mean, both have misdirects, I guess, maybe, but anyway, that one's a 7 out of 10 for me. And according to Disney+, Plus, this is similar to Air Force One, 8 out of 10. Yeah, that, that makes a pretty good um, amount of sense. Th th there are significant differences, but yeah. Con Air, 8 out of 10, also about, you know, one person on a plane, you know, one, one good guy on a plane who has to deal with something dangerous. Unstoppable, which I gave a 7 out of 10, which, you know, unstoppable is essentially speed, but a train instead of a bus. Yeah, I'm not sure I see very many comparisons between unstoppable and flight plan, but whatever. I mean, they're both set on a vehicle that moves fast, I guess. Anyway, deja vu, 7 out of 10. Yeah, that one, I, I really don't know what is particularly comparable. I, thrillers starring Hollywood actors that people like and respect, where they're playing a good guy that has to stop someone evil. I, I, or, yeah, deal with something dangerous. And Anyway, Speed, 7 out of 10, already mentioned. Not sure there's that many comparisons there. Enemy of the State... Okay, seven out of ten. I, I, I got nothing. I, I don't really see anything. Oh, oh, conspiracy. I guess is is the is the where they have something in common because certainly it would appear that you know like I'm not gonna give away what the answer is, but one of the potential answers to what on earth is going on would be a conspiracy. Now, let's see. And Crimson Tide, 7 out of 10, which is also about people on a vessel that's moving and good guy, not necessarily trusted. Yeah, some of these are not that... Anyway, the plot's basic premise, albeit with a different... Uh, 
is similar to a 1955 episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents titled Into Thin Air as well as, 19, as Hitchcock's 1938 film The Lady Vanishes. It is also reminiscent of the 1950s British film So Long at the Fair. I haven't watched those three so I can't compare and the IMDb Frequently Asked Questions section has several recommendations. The only one of them I've watched myself is Red Eye and I already talked about that so but yeah you know if you If you, if you want more like Flight Plan, frequently asked questions section of IMDb. Now, m might be a decent place to look. Again, cannot. Now, let's see. I mean, so yeah. For these, sometimes I go into whether the title has any special significance. And I mean, in this, let's see, the the there's the double meaning that you know, a flight plan normally refers to. Oh, you know, we we fly from here to here. We expect to, you know, take off at this at, at this approximate time. You know, landing at this approximate time. That's that's normally what people mean when they say flight plan, but. Kylie, Kyle, hmm, Kyle, Kyle searches the plane as in a plan, like, of, of the plane, like, like, um, building plan kind of thing. So, yeah. Now... I originally watched this with my fiance back when we were still together, and I think we both enjoyed it. I, th I think we really got into the mystery. We we did we did not really like the ending, but I was surprised. I I honestly remember. Yeah, it's it's one of the like um, rose colored glasses. I think is is basically when I watch it with her. I think I liked it because she got really into it, and yeah, I, th I think that that almost must have been it because I've seen far better thrillers. I think if I watched it by myself, I I would not have really liked it that much. But so yeah, I quoting fellow critics here. The film offers nothing we haven't seen before. The movie has plot holes the size of an Airbus in the script. It might not seem quite so awful, even reprehensible, if it didn't waste a pretty good cast, or if it didn't trot out that ultimate poor taste cliche, a child in peril. And that critic gave it a 1.5 out of 4. So. On, on the writing. This was written by multiple people, including Billy Ray, who, like, he both wrote and directed Shattered Glass. I love that movie, but then, more recently, he wrote Terminator Dark Fate, which I'm not gonna go into my issues with that movie in this video, but that one definitely could have... The script is not... The script has significant issues for that movie. But then, yeah, he also, he wrote Hunger, the first Hunger Games movie, State of Play, Reach, and also Heart's War. Yeah, Heart's War could also have been, have had a, a better script. It's also, one of the other writers is Peter A. Dowling, who has written nothing I've heard of, but, you know, maybe you have. The movies Stagnant, Reasonable Doubt, Sacrifice, and Black and Blue. And three episodes of Transformers Rescue Bots. And he directed Sacrifice, both Stagnant and Sacrifice. So he actually, of, of, the, of the five movies he's written, he directed two of them. So, yeah. So yeah, quoting fellow critics, 
I didn't hate this movie, mostly I was dismissive of it. Nothing engaged me, interested me, or interested me, and the ending made me roll my eyes. It's true. A bad script can a bad script kills a film every time. This thriller is effective if you can accept that, as with some of John Dixon Carr's Locking Mysteries, the trickiness counts more than any plausibility. This wasn't very fulfilling, and I got the feeling that explanations for situations were added after someone in the production team asked why about them. The plane was the biggest in the world. I mean, how long does it take a lift to go two floors down? I was waiting for them to start crawling around Jeffrey's tombs. And a darn good thing it is, too, that Foster should happen to be a propulsion engineer, because she knows her way around that monstrous crate to the extent that she can disable the plane without endangering the passengers. She has an awesome memory when you come right down to it. The interior of the avionics section looks like the inside of Hal's brain, yet she knows precisely which jack to pull out of which plug to cause the oxygen masks to pop out of their cabinets, and which lead to short out so the lights blow in the passenger cabins. Now that's saying a lot for a propulsion engineer, I would think. This is one of those movies where the concept is something that is easy to make scary and tense, but when it comes to explaining it, is never going to... I'm aware that there are people out there who heard the explanation given and walked away from the movie and was like, that made sense. I'm not one of them. Yeah, the, as soon as it starts explaining what actually happened, like, it, yeah, I, I can't even, well, I can, but not without spoilers, so that'll be in one of the next two sections, three sections, yeah. Now, and, yeah, according to Wikipedia, the Association of Professional Flight Attendants called for an official boycott of Flight Plan, which they say depicts flight attendants as rude, uncaring, and indifferent. I would, I 100% agree. I feel like every actor who plays, a, who portrays a flight attendant was cast after delivering a good, convincing response to the direction without saying a word. Can you use your mouth to make yourself look like the world biggest a-hole this this is the kind of movie where you really have to just shut off your brain and just go by emotion to really enjoy it much now yeah so this movie does a bad job handling plot twists there aren't too many but they're pretty bad Not not too few either. I would say they're not too easy to figure out for the viewer. They're just they're too far fetched to guess. It's not one of those movies where you have to like it's not difficult to keep up with the twists, even on the first viewing. It's noteworthy that the two, and to an extent, number three, top-rated, most useful MVD user reviews are the ones that really tear apart the problems with the plot twists. And in fact, many, possibly most, of the voted, you know, yeah, voted most useful MVD user reviews criticize the film. Most of them especially criticize the twist. Quoting fellow critics here, it's always a bad sign in a thriller when the big reveal is greeted by hoots of derisive laughter. The movie plummets into a swamp of ever-increasing and increasingly amusing preposterosity. Yeah, I guess that's how you... that's the right way to say that. Anticipating the explanation of what's going on proves more interesting than the explanation. It's in the final act when flight plan goes from passable to pitiful. As with many modern thrillers, the actual plot, once it comes to life, is highly implausible. There are a few too many turns towards the end, and the climax errs towards 
be anticlimactic. The problem is the plot ultimately makes no internal sense, and the underlying emotional issues, while well, beautifully played by the talented Miss Foster, are idiotic as well. All movies like this are manipulative by nature, but the really good ones hide the strings. Hitchcock was a master of this art. While the bad ones, like Black Clan, display their flaws so obviously, you find yourself sitting in the theater, snorting at the improbability of what's happening. The big twist that's supposed to shock doesn't make sense. Supposedly intelligent characters act extremely stupidly, and the emotional manipulation is ham-handed and ineffective. However, there's also a fundamental flaw. In any story where a character is fanatically claiming something that is verifiably false, there are literally only two outcomes. Either the raving loon is right, and there's likely a big conspiracy to cover it up, or she's wrong, and is most likely completely crazy. I won't spoil the film by outlining the ending, but I will remark that either answer would turn a film into something that it didn't appear to be from the outset, and then turns it into something a tad more generic. That's the fundamental problem with the film. Despite an intriguing setup, it falls apart at the end, when it's forced to actually show its hand. It then becomes a completely different and far less interesting film. I, yeah. It doesn't help that the resolution is completely riddled with holes. It's a shame about the ending because I genuinely enjoyed the movie's setup. Playing on the audience's expectations, knowing that many viewers are aware the nature of the child's existence will be called into question, the film teases us with early shots that make us ask the same question. Sometimes the child is conspicuously absent from shots, sometimes people seem to acknowledge her, sometimes people look at our lead character kind of strange, as if she's talking to herself, while the daughter seems to interact with her environment. It's deliciously wishy-washy, and one which seems aware that most viewers will go in knowing that Jodie Foster will end up looking for a child nobody else believes exists. Foster's go-for-broke plunge into the material makes the flimsy twists barely tolerable. Flat Clan grows more and more ponderous and frustrating as the reasons behind Kyle's predicament are revealed to be increasingly outlandish. The third act begins with another twist, but this one is so arduous, absurd, and out of character for the film that the entire plot, stretching back to scene one, is sabotaged. You have to admit, implausibility aside, the final act is pretty thrilling. The absurd conclusion would be laughable if it wasn't such a disappointment. This is an unbelievable variation of a locked room mystery. Locked room mysteries are the type of stories where someone is murdered in a locked room that no one can get into, nor could they have gotten out without leaving some sign. When they are done well, say the kennel murder case, you truly have no idea what's going on. You believe a miracle has taken place. When it's done badly, you end up with a movie like this. This could have been a good film. It starts off reasonably well, very short run of the film. The director has already demonstrated that he assumes the viewers are all gullible idiots. The plot holes are so large you could fly an oversized jumbo jet through them. It deteriorates, deteriorates from there, and pretty soon you can see that the director is no Hitchcock, or even Ed Wood. Now there's an insult. That's holy crap. The ending is an insult to the intelligence of a chimpanzee, and destroyed what vestige of credibility might have remained. That is, that is Alan Moore criticizing Frank Miller's writing in 300 levels of just destroying someone with words that, yeah. The movie's use of astonishingly unbelievable coincidences not only breaks several simple dramatic laws, but invents new ones to mercilessly stomp on. In Speed, having Sandra Bullock ride the bus she, because she had her license revoked, making her the perfect candidate to keep the bus going over 50 miles per hour, was a believable and pleasing piece of serendipity. Having Foster be this plane's architect and therefore know every place to look is beyond is contrived beyond forgiveness. And, yeah, so, spoiler for the ending of this movie. 
But the moment the reality of what happened on the plane is divulged, the movie goes straight to hell, becoming more and more ridiculous before it finally offers up a stupid, crowd-pleasing finale that invites derision and laughter. The climax would have been fine had Kyle been played by Steven Seagal or Jean-Claude Van Damme. No more spoilers for the time being. Holy crap. That's... But yeah, that's very, very true. Now, so the, the direction, I would say largely focused. Robert Schwenke directed this, who's German, and I haven't watched anything else. Oh wait, he also directed Red, which I gave a 7 out of 10. I must have been feeling generous. I, I'm not sure I've given a 7 out of 10 today. Anyway, I'm going to briefly... Yes, this is this is the list of the twelve movies he's directed on the creation of earthquakes. Which uh, actually, that one is in pre-production. But he directed Snake Eyes, which, yeah, The Captain, Allegiant, and Insurgent. I have to admit, I. I'm pretty happy with my decision. I ended up only choosing one of the film series adaptations of YA dystopia. Dystopian? YA? Yeah, one of those. And that was Hunger Games, and I'm extremely happy because I love those four movies. Not saying all of them are perfect. The shaky cam in the first one definitely is frustrating, but... I think ins ins Insurgent, was that the one where, like, they ended up making all the, they ended up adapting all of them, but the last one was, like, direct-to-video or something, because they were doing so poorly in theater, or, or did they end up just not doing, he's only listed as directing two of them, although, wait, no, the first one is Divergent, Divergent, Insurgent, Allegiant, so I guess, yeah. He also directed R.I.P.D., which... I love Men in Black, but I've never watched Men in Black and been like, you know, I really wish that this was about ghosts and that everyone I've ever heard talk about the movie said that it was incredibly generic and just not fun to watch. The Time Traveler's Wife, The Family Jewels, Tattoo, and Heaven are the movies that he's directed. So, yeah, that's... The movie didn't end his career. That is, you know, so sometimes a bad movie will end the career of some of the people working on it. That did not happen here. Whether we like it or not. Quoting Bill Griggs here, most thrillers diverge from reality at some point. That's when the skill of the director comes into play. One could argue, for example, that Die Hard is no less preposterous than Flight Planet. But John McTiernan, who helmed the Bruce Willis action movie, understood what it takes to keep the audience disbelief suspended. The same is not true of Flight Planet's director, Robert Schwenke. The moment plot elements start going over the top, he loses the audience. Alfred Hitchcock used the term refrigerator movie to describe a film with absurd plot twists that are recognized by a viewer only in retrospect later in the evening while getting a late night snack out of the refrigerator. Unfortunately, the flat plan holes become apparent as soon as they develop. Instead of being plugged, they grow larger and more obvious. The trajectory of flat plan resembles that of a plane on a troubled flight. At the beginning, it soars, then it levels off before going into a tailspin from which it never recovers. The script is carefully plotted, hedging no bets and leaving no stone unturned, and that may be its only fault. The plot is so smoothly planned out and drawn out for us that it loses some intensity. Ironically, the opening, with Foster making burial arrangements in regards to her husband, later feeling watched from her apartment window, are spookily dreamlike, but the director becomes much more sober once the action moves to the plane. And yet his film could really use much use more of that surreal what's going on ambience he initially captured so simply. I think the movie would have been ten times better if, for the majority of it, it did have this sense 
that just, you know, can, can we completely trust what is going on? And, and the director shows that he knows how to do that because he does do it really, really well for the first several minutes of the movie. There have been several movies that confine themselves to airplanes, Passenger 57, Executive Decision, and Red Eye come to mind. The setting poses interesting challenges for any director. Robert Schwenkner rises to the task admirably, defining the space, keeping the suspense high, and most importantly, creating that feeling of claustrophobia so vital to the stock, to the genre. So effective is the atmosphere during flight that I actually had to remind myself I was grounded in a theater at one point. I've never watched in the movie theater, but I can imagine it the 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 scenes of turbulence and such probably play incredible in a movie theater. And that is, you know, like now that it, well, yeah, now that it's like on streaming, you know, home theaters can do a decent job of of replicating the experience. Foster should get frequent prior miles for this role. She shifts her character into panic mode so quickly that we have that we but we also have no trouble believing she could be using her marvelous. Schwenke handles the claustrophobic environments efficiently enough, though he dallies too long before letting anxiety give way to action. Very true, yeah. For starters, setting the action on a super jet half the size of Delaware is completely non-conducive to suspense. The people who made the 1952 cop on a train thriller the narrow margin, the original speed, and the current red eye were all intensely aware of a simple but necessary component in transportation-based thrillers that Flight Plan is obviously completely unaware of. Claustrophobia. Put it this way, spending half the movie's running time thinking about what the Zucker Brothers could have done with the Ponderosa-sized jet doesn't exactly whiten my knuckles. How will it play out, or what is really going on? A lot of the run, lot, lot of the runtime gets taken up by a bunch of people going on a scavenger hunt on a plane. It's really tedious and boring to watch. In fact, this whole movie is tedious. Even though 99% of the movie takes place on board an airplane, kudos to director Schwenke and the movie crew for pulling that magic off. I was invited to go see this movie over the weekend. Normally I avoid airplane movies like The Plague. Usually they're unrealistic and stupid. I should have heeded my own advice. With such strong story elements at his disposal, separation from claustrophobia, unsympathetic officials, and shifty-eyed suspicious passengers, German director Robert Schwenkner constructs a sweaty, cleverly convoluted story that, that is nevertheless a touch too cold and remote to connect with the impact it could have had. The Titanic-sized aircraft becomes a character, initially a suffocating claustrophobic presence, but as the film explores every nook and cranny of the metal tube, there is far more made of it than is entirely necessary. Robert Schwenker, the director of Insurgent in 2015, directs with capable and determined German efficiency and seriousness, intent on making it seem much better than it really is, and to some extent that works, producing one of those guilty pleasure entertainments. Director Schwenker makes the most of the movie's elaborate aircraft set, managing to make the plane's interiors look both expansive and claustrophobic. Now, the, let's see, yeah, so the, the start of the movie, you, you know, like the first several minutes are really completely drenched in grief. I, if only the movie could have kept it up, but yeah, the, yeah, the, the opening of the movie you get a sense of Kat's grief, her love for her daughter, and their relationship with each other. And, quoting Bill Krigster, set, sets up its premise quickly, then simply has nowhere to go. The first five minutes of the film are kind of confusing, as time is juxtaposed and not really explained much, besides trying to show the relationship between husband and wife, and suggesting that the tragedy might have led to Foster's deteriorate mindset. In the hold is the body of Kyle's husband, whose death may or may not have been an accident. He fell, and now Julia is terrified of stairs and refuses to walk on the icy sidewalks. Flight plan opens with a confusing flashback that sets the tone of the rest of the film. The opening sequences tell you almost nothing, and the information only starts to trickle in as the story unfolds in real time. The script by first first time writer Dowling and Ray Zero is taught with suspense and unanswered questions almost till the end. 
Clearly, they pay homage to Hitchcock and style and storytelling techniques. Perhaps I'm a little too smart for a thriller like this, for I correctly guessed the bad guys midway through the film. The bad guys' motives and schemes remain a mystery to me, and I like that. We keep asking the question, why? At times the plot seems convoluted, though. A lot of things, if you really stop to think about them, don't make much sense. I suppose... Yeah. Brief spoiler for the movie. For example, how could there only be one air marshal on an international flight with 450 passengers who sits in coach and nowhere near the cockpit in case of a hijack? No more spoilers, it's time to move. Why didn't anyone see the little girl, including the ticket or gate agents? The plot is a little too clever, too perfect, as if the bad guys have thought of every detail, every minor wrinkle, and every move Kyle may take. Quite impossible. The film opens in Germany at a train station in Alexanderplatz. I see inner cuts between Kyle Pratt and Foster at the train station and flashbacks to a morgue and then her husband's coffin. Ominously rumbling piano notes and a cutaway to birds suggest that this isn't an ordinary death, but alright, I'll suspend my amusement for the moment and run with it. Kyle first appears in the mid-dream, walking with her dead husband through Berlin's snowy streets wishing that she might stop him from ascending to, to the rooftop from which he fell or jumped. That was that was so nicely done. It's 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 so frustrating that the movie just goes completely downhill after that. Because it literally like there's there's this there's this bit where like her husband is on the way up the stairs in the apartment building and Kyle is like can we just walk together through, what was it she said, through the streets, I, I guess, some, something like that. And, like, it it doesn't, it takes maybe half or a full second before he responds. It's not like, if it was a normal scene, you wouldn't think much of it. But there's this sense that, like, it's, yeah, she's, it's, it's basically a dream, and she's trying to, like she's she's thinking if only he didn't go up there and it yeah so nicely done and the rest of the movie deserves to be so much better yeah the the movie's opening deserves the rest of the movie to be much much better than it actually is now let's see. i'm not going to give away the ending. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. It does fit what came before. It's not a good ending. It's like, if, uh, I'm not talking positive or negative. I'm talking, it is not a well made ending. Now, there isn't really Deus Ex Machina, but there is a there are other types of convenient writing. And I'll grant, the ending is one of the most difficult things about a thriller. Because, you know, th there's a certain percentage of notable exceptions, but... I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify this as one of those exceptions. Now, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, the movie... The, the ending resolves everything, and, like, there are things about the ending that mean that the movie couldn't have ended way, way sooner. But yeah, you know, the, the other genres than thriller are much easier. Action movie, no problem. You just have the good guy and the bad guy face off have a cure, and have a clear conclusion to the fight. Drama, the most dramatic thing in the movie happens. But thrillers, you know, they have to empower the hero who up to this point has been very disempowered. With that said, I'm not saying that you can't do a better job than this. Now, let's... Yeah, so, quoting fellow critics, boring climax. The movie loses some of its initial atmospheric tension as paranoid thrills... Spoiler, 
give way to Rambo hijinks. The first half, which is vintage Hitchcock, is far, by far superior to the second half, which is pure Steven Seagal. No more spoilers than I'm being. Now, I don't, I didn't personally lose interest along the way, but some people did, and I can understand why. Like, it is basically, it's the kind of movie where either you are, like, basically 100% with Kyle, you are desperate to find out what happened to Julia or you're not and if you're not you get kind of frustrated with like yeah it, it's the movie doesn't really it's it's clear that they made the movie expecting you to be on her side the there are simply you know there, there are a number of things where the way she behaves is really frustrating and some of them downright unacceptable but the movie doesn't really and it's it's because they think that we're with her otherwise they they would know that we would want there to be some kind of yeah according to the picture the first Half a flight plan is taut and reasonably thrilling, a sort of dust bolt on an airplane. The relative spaciousness of the double decker jetliner allows the characters extra space to roam, and as Pratt knows the inner workings of an airplane, we get to see the avionics area and the cargo holds below. The early parts of the movie also set a creepy tone as things seen out of the corner of Pratt's eye or words overheard from Francis Ballow penetrate her consciousness without really making a dent. Now, I mean, one thing, I do appreciate that the movie, that it's the mother and not the father, you know, the, this is, like, if this movie had been made in the 80s, it would probably, it would probably have been Bruce Willis Possibly Mel Gibson going around, or Mel Gibson, would that have been 90s, I guess, you know, going around trying to find the, the kid. But, you know, this, I mean, it does definitely, it is a movie that says that if a woman is, if, if a mother is afraid that her child is in danger, it is okay for her to act on that anxiety. And I would say it pushes that too far, but it definitely is a thing where, like, you know, so many movies have basically said that if a woman, if a woman is worried about a thing that men aren't also worried about, she, she just needs to calm down and, you know, possibly even be slapped in order to accomplish that. So I really appreciate that. Which, which is also why I, I saw one person say that the movie was a f feminist lesbian role for Jodie Foster. I guess missing the part where she had a child with a man that she had sex with. I mean, I mean, at most she could be bi, but I guess if you're no, if you're not with a man right now, you're a lesbian to this guy. That's yeah. Anyway, I really appreciate that the movie does say that, you know, if, if a woman is worried about, if, if a mother is worried about her child, that needs to be respected. Now, let's see. It brings us to the characters. And I mean, I will say, 
you know, the movie did make me believe that Kyle knew the, the plane inside out. I'm pretty sure, let's see, Sean Bean, I'm pretty sure he's not American. His American accent is fairly convincing. Now, let's see. Some of the characters you don't get that much definition for, like you you see them, you see how they behave in some situations, but you really don't get very much. And, yeah, you know, that is, so, some people will find that it's simply too little. I definitely do think we could definitely have known more about Kyle herself. We basically, we know that she designed the plane. She lived and worked in Berlin because her husband was there. And she's going back to America so that Julia can be with her grandparents, her, you know, Kyle's mother and father. But that's basically it, and all of that is literally just there to explain, you know, why was she in Berlin? Why is she going to America now? She, you know, like, like literally, if you remove those, we'd be sitting there wondering, well, why was she in Berlin? Why is she going to America? They're, they're only there to, to fill in those holes, and evidently the, the screenwriters thought that this would be sufficient, that we don't really need to know much of anything about our main character. Once again, I have no idea if she was always really like anxious. And I I feel like that's a it's it's for us to really appreciate how the grief yeah, you know, the the grief process is going for her. We do kind of need to know what she was like before she started grieving and like like the I'm not saying open the movie before she starts grieving I think it was the right choice to do that but I think just just have like maybe have her on the phone with one of her parents and like it doesn't have to be long just a few lines and just one of them says are, are you sure you're okay? You're usually much more talkative. Or, like, you sound... You're... Uh, let's see... Yeah, you... Uh, yeah, never mind. That, that would do it, but... And it is also an issue that a, a lot of people are not gonna like Kyle, and... There really isn't, like, the movie was basically made figuring that the audience would empathize with her. Probably figuring that we would focus most on what she personally has lost and not really on the overall situation. Like, where she views the experience as nobody other than her, is in a bad situation, and the movie invites us to see it that way as well, and it's, it's that, like, I don't think, you know, some, something like that could work if it wasn't, like, like, the, the movie definitely explores post-9-11 anxieties, and, yeah, like, the idea of this this one person on, you know, a, a person on a plane, like, as, as panicked and anxious as she is, you know, obviously a lot of the other passengers get scared. And the movie doesn't really treat this as something that, Yeah, it, it basically acts as though she's entitled 
to do whatever is necessary to find her daughter. And all they had to do to get around it would be to have it set in a place that isn't stressful. You know, like, let's see, maybe like a, a public park in a, in a, yeah, yeah, something like that, you know. And she could be running around asking other people who have visited the park if they know where her daughter is or something. But, like, even if you don't, you don't have to have a fear of flying to be upset by a passenger on a plane. Like, yeah, just the, the way she, she acts, like, shouting at the staff and running and, yeah. I personally felt empathy for for Julia, but some people said that there was just she there was so little definition there. They didn't really have anything to grab onto, and I can understand what they mean for for sure. It it is basic like we know so little about her. It is basically just we should we should be afraid because she's a child. She you know she might be in danger. That that's basically it. We're not, you know, like let's let's see, what would be a good example of a movie where we care specifically about the child. Hmm. I mean, I don't watch a lot of movies with endangered children. Run. Yeah, I'm not sure I can offhand think of one. I suppose an argument could be made for 28 weeks later, which I just happened to see out of the corner of my eye on my, ah, uh, what's it called, DV, right? But then, for sure, those characters those child characters can be very frustrating. But we know about them, we know what they're passionate about. Now, so yeah, Joey Foster as Kyle Pratt, depending on your perspective on the movie, she either is or is not an airplane Karen, which is like watching this movie today, like it's just Oh no, oh please stop. Don't don't do that. Don't do that. And there's like there's this Yeah. It's we, we really with with recent videos that have come out of airplane Karen's, real life airplane Karen's. This movie definitely plays differently. Like to the point where it almost becomes like that we're more afraid of what she's gonna do to other passengers. Like if you if you watch just the scenes of her panicking aboard the plane, if you don't see like how Yeah, I I would argue the the first minutes before she boards the plane humanize her somewhat. But once she gets on the plane, once once she can't find Julia and she's freaking out and scaring other passengers. She's basically an airplane Karen. And yeah. And yeah, she's she plays it's it's very mama bear. According to my DP trivia, Jodie Foster's world was originally written for Sean Penn. The original character's name of Kyle was the indicator. Coincidentally, Penn's role in the game was originally intended for Jodie Foster. I could kind of see that. I, I, I do think that it was. Yeah, I, th I think Sean Penn. I, I, he would, he would still have been like, as uh, what's the word? I'm still not sure we would have been on his side. But, but I, I think. I'm I'm glad that it's him and not Jerry Foster in the game. I, I love both actors. 
And, you know, I, I saw some say, you know, what kind of woman is named Kyle? I'm pretty, wasn't, wasn't there a young woman named Kyle in the, in Child's Play 2? I, f I feel like the, the, yeah, the, the young woman in that was named Kyle as well. So, it's not that it never happens, I guess, anyway. Quoting fellow critics, in keeping with most of Foster's performances, she plays a strong-willed, intelligent woman who overcomes difficult circumstances. As expected, Foster delivers and pulls the audience into the story. For all its high production values, A-list cast, and classy lensing, Flight Plan is a bit of a bore. Much of the blame for this belongs to Jodie Foster, whose performance, all wounded sincerity and blinky eyes, is as efficient and bloodless as the cinematography. As in Tag Room, Foster constantly bashes us over the head with her mother in the chutzpah without generating an ounce of sleep. I don't know. I thought she was great in Tag Room. Anyway. It's a crucial touch to have the mother already in a fragile emotional condition before the daughter's disappearance. It lends credence to the flight crew's suspicion that the mother is simply overwrought or unbalanced, and it gives Foster license to raise the roof dramatically. Foster doesn't have to work herself up into a state. She starts in a state and builds from there. She makes a dynamic locus for audience sympathy, not someone charming or conventionally likable or engaging in a vulnerability, but someone driven, obsessive, and difficult operating out of an animal instinct of motherly protectiveness. I think one of the reasons that Panic Room works so much better is that she's not treating innocent people badly in that movie. You know, like, the things that... I'm not going to spoil that movie here, but, you know, the people that she engages with are the burglars, you know, so... That, that's, yeah. A mother who loses her daughter during a transatlantic flight and who no one, including most of the time the audience, believes. Foster's character, although confused and frustrated, does get annoying after a bit, and seeing as we're meant to identify and sympathize with her, that is not a good thing. Foster, a very long engagement, reprises her mother in parallel role as she did in Panic Room. She is an extraordinary actress, conveying both vulnerability and strength the same time, at times she looks so beaten, it's heartbreaking. Jodie Foster storms through the plane with the determination of General MacArthur and the Battle Cry of, Where's my daughter? Where's my daughter? Where's my daughter? It's an obscenely big plane. Where's my daughter? asks Jody. Did you search the plane's tennis courts? The plane's new ballpark. Get me this plane's governor. Now! Foster's cobalt blue eyes and pale pointy features have rarely been used to such ambiguous effect. Is she the hardest or the most hurt-looking hurt woman you've ever seen? The contrast between Kyle's multiple layers of loss and the flurry of life that goes on without her is briefly compelling. Jodie Foster takes so long between films, you think that she choose a project that allows her to do something more than hide in a reinforced box or frantically search an airplane. But in her most recent efforts, Panic and Flight Plan respectively, your, the award-winning actress has shown an affinity for those indefatigable heroine roles. Thankfully, she's damn good at them. Nobody teeters on the brink of tears quite like Jodie Foster. It's during Kyle's slow journey from worried to frantic to obsessed that Miss Foster shines. The actress is so good she actually manages to show more range when the emotion frantic than most actresses can in their whole repertoire. She elevates what is a standard B-movie thriller to something more personal and emotional than it has any right to be. Foster should give frequent crier miles for this role. She shifts her character into panic mode so quickly that we also have no trouble believing she could, she could be rooting for Marvels. While this movie is designed to have the audience sympathize with Foster's character, the only, the only emotion it evoked in me was annoyance with her. She's too obsessive and selfish. Frightening the other passengers from committing acts of sabotage while in flight in her attempts to find her daughter. I found myself wishing the crew would sedate her. See Jody worry, see Jody run, and please don't ask why we don't tranquilize her for the safety of other passengers. Jet fuel can't gaslight steel beams. Her actions, not not her knowledge, seem to be why she was chosen. She goes from zero to ninety percent frantic and jumps to authoritative psychotic as soon as anyone questions her. Jodie Foster's character does not convey a feeling of sympathy to the audience, or at least me, but
but she was the right actor for the part because she has the ability and the looks of someone who's psychotic. This film plays with the unreliable narrator technique where you don't know if the story that is unfolding is based on the reality of the passengers or the reality inside Jodie Foster. Foster is a good enough actress, but is too tightly wound in this one for my taste. Jodie Foster as a grieving widow and paranoid mother seems to have very deep depth. I usually love the movies that Jodie Foster makes, however, this performance has no levels. She seems to be freaking out from the beginning of the movie. There seems to be no change in emotional levels leading up to Julia's disappearance. To top it all off, Jodie Foster's character and performance are completely unlikable from the start. Allowing for the fact that she's supposed to be stressed taking the body of her husband home, she still starts the movie two steps away from Shiro only to cross the line almost instantly. If I were the crew, I wouldn't have listened to her either. This is the worst performance I've ever seen Foster give. Kyle wakes a few hours later to discover Julia is missing, so subsequently begins the frantic madness and redundant chanting of, Where is my daughter? From here, the searching and conspiracy theories begins, began to unfold. The film is intense, and the performances, as you'd expect from this kind of cast, are absolutely stellar. The stage in her life, Foster seems to get motherhood for whatever that's worth. Get motherhood. She's convincing as a panic-stricken parent, and even more convincing when forced to question her own sanity. Featuring repetitive scenes of Foster crying, Foster whimpering, Foster screaming, and Foster running around. Doesn't have its hero in question, it, conviction, it'd be better if it had. Since Foster plays warming up for a straight jacket, jacket panic with a clenched intensity rare to behold in a Hollywood actress, I for one was rooting for the radical that is Nuthouse option. To watch Miss Foster storm through a phony airplane for an entire movie has its very minor pleasures, given the numerous close-ups you can study her lovely face at your leisure, but there is nothing here to feed the head or fray the nerves. Jodie Foster's character is once sharp, cunning, and calculating while whilst also depressed, paralyzed, and lethargic. You can't fault Foster's very effective tense performance at all. The fact that she fights like a girl not seen. Except that it's utterly wasted in the service of such disgracefully substandard material. Watching her here is like seeing a world-class concert yell violinist performing in a Chuck E. Cheese. I have to admit that the writer did convincingly portray what a crazy delusional woman must be going through, as well as how hard that must be on those around her. And yeah, so spoilers for the ending. I guess someone decided that wasn't a good enough story though, so they switched it around right at the end and made her sane, even though it meant that the story no longer could be. I don't know how they expected us to care what happened to the lady's daughter after they spent the bulk of the movie convincing us that she didn't exist. The main characters are never really given any background or story. Not that this would have kept me from wanting to leave the theater after the protagonist started pulling headphone jacks, headphone type jacks out of the control panel to wreak havoc on the airplane. No more spoilers for the time being. I've never understood why people think Jodie Foster is such a good actress, and this is certainly her worst performance. She switches unpredictably from being completely wooden and dull to being way too over the top and just annoying, as if she was fresh out of the Marsha Gay Harden school acting. You're supposed to feel sympathy for the character and think that the crew are monsters for not helping her. But I just wanted someone to knock her out and toss her out of the damn thing. Holy crap, dude. Was that was that more for the character or for him not liking Jodie Foster to begin with? Anyway. Jodie Foster screeches out helpless cries, similar to that of a raptor. Julia! Julia! She screams, inspiring first sympathy, but then annoyance as this goes on throughout the entire movie. If Jodie Foster is in something, I usually expect it to be to at least be a decent film. But not even the great Miss Foster can save this one. After about 15 minutes of her ranting, I was ready to issue parachutes to everyone so they could escape, because at least I could change the channel. Pratt cares only about the well-being of her daughter and is willing to endanger the entire plane just to rescue Julia. Car windows are smashed open, the plane's lights are turned out. Air masks come tumbling down, all thanks. If that is not a display of motherly love, I don't know what is. Moving on to Peter Sarsgaard 
as Gene Carson. Once again, quoting fellow critics here, Peter Sarsgaard, one of today's better young character actors, is wasted in Frank's role of Air Marshal. For much of the film, all he does is shadow Foster and look sulky. The bickering back and forth between Foster and Sarsgaard becomes tiresome, and the eeriness dissipates without any humans interesting to replace it. Kyle has been having a few delusions that her husband's going to be alive, but she always comes to her senses and realizes that he's not. When she falls asleep during the flight and wakes up to find her daughter missing, she becomes alarmed and proceeds to look for Julia. Is Kyle imagining her daughter is still alive too? The entire crew and all the passengers seem to think so, particularly one man named Carson, who proceeds to ask all the hard questions that she doesn't want to hear. The performances drive the film, Foster is always great and resurrects her contact roles, a characteristic theme to world of skeptics that she isn't crazy. It's not an easy task when the lead skeptic in this movie is played by Hollywood's best skeptic, Peter Sarsgaard, who earned that right as chuckling in shattered glass. Peter Sarsgaard plays a concerned air marshal who doesn't exactly inspire confidence in the kind of myth-like protection our government offers, but does give an interesting take as his character changes with the movies. It's so good that the, movie, the film will be, might be worth seeing just for a quick analysis of his quietly confident performance. Sarsgaard continues to be one of Hollywood's most gifted unsung talents. At some point, he's bound to land in a film that'll give him some much deserved recognition. But Flight Plan isn't it. He didn't get recognition after Boys Don't Cry. He was incredible in that movie. Anyway, for Peter Sarsgaard's Bill Murray low energy style, perfect in Shadow Glass, is screechingly out of place here. Sean Bean makes a better foil than Carson, whose role is mostly rele relegated to glowering and crap like a surly guard dog. Peter Sarsgaard is Carson with fellow air marshal, with his droopy, half-opened eyes, pretty much, he pretty much looks stunned throughout the entire film. Also, Peter Sarsgaard is pretty great as usual. He is very believable through being charming and inviting at the beginning and then cruel and commanding when Foster becomes ridiculously out of hand. If only he had told her how terrible a performance she was delivering. Sarsgaard... Uh, yeah, actually, I have to this. And yeah, Sean Bean plays the, the captain of the plane. And he does a good job. The, it's, it is a good use of Sean Bean. And Marlene Boston plays Julia. According to a critic, both mother and daughter are emotionally fragile, but the bond is strong as we watch them cling to what normalcy they have left. Little Julia, Marlene Boston, is so scared to go outside to the waiting taxi and onto the airport that she has to hide beneath her mother's coat. A sweet depiction of how we are sheltered beneath the loving ones of the mother who knows our needs and puts them before her own heart. Eric Christensen could have been used more. And from Wikipedia, for casting, Schlepke said that to make flight, flight plan as realistic as possible, he wanted naturalistic, subdued performances. The director picked each of the 300 passengers to auditions. According to fellow critics, we identify not with Joe Foster, but with the 423 other passengers whose trip has been loused up by this hysterical woman. Also ingenious is the movie's casting. I find the major flaw with most thrillers is that they tend to be t they tend to typecast their villains. It's entirely possible to guess the killer of the, or the villain based solely on the star on the list of stars in the film. Flight Plan plays with this sort of expectation. It knows that if it gives us a particularly sinister actor, the viewer will suspect him of some conspiracy, while populating the cast with actors known for playing good guys 
leading viewers to guess that this is actually a drama about Lois pretending to be a thriller. The film solves this dilemma by giving its two largest supporting roles to actors known for playing morally ambiguous or sleazy characters. Sean Bean isn't exactly the first person I choose, I choose to cast as a pilot, which is why he works so well in the role. It's genuinely surreal to hear him talk with a very posh Timothy Dalton style British accent. I said British accent? Wow. Huh. And anyway, as opposed to his usual rubber brogue, he always looks sleazy, so putting him in a position of authority is a wonderfully clever casting call. Similarly, the sleazy Peter Sarsgaard isn't exactly the most obvious choice for the role of Air Marshal, so casting the two major supporting characters as somewhat sinister character actors throws the audience's suspicions into doubt. It really could be a big sinister conspiracy involving the entire cast, but it could also be one huge red herring. You really don't know who to trust throughout the film. Are the flight attendants in on? Is the captain bad? The air marshal? Swanko makes these subtle moments of characters grin or stare ambiguously at others. That's very true. The movie resorts to cheap tricks to try to fool you, characters giving each other suspicious glances when in retrospect they have no reason to, etc. Of the 400 plus passengers, isn't it within the realm of possibility that at least a few of them, especially the other parents on board, would treat Foster with some compassion and consideration rather than responding to the admittedly unique circumstances with complete selfishness and heartlessness, even if their plans were being disrupted. And let's see. Moving on to the dialogue, so there is at least a little bit of just like white noise dialogue that you're really not expecting. There's actually there's one line near the end that kind of Yeah, I'm I'm just gonna go ahead. Spoiler for the ending of the movie. At the very ending, after Julia has been found, one character, we, we, we can't tell who, but one of the passengers goes, I told you I saw a girl. I have to believe that this was added by, like, a, a troll in the editing department, because the move, that, that one line completely ruins the entire setup of the movie. If even one passenger did say, like, why didn't they call over a flight attendant and said, yes, I did see a girl. The, the whole... And, and it's, such a, it's such an obvious plot hole. It's such a ridiculous thing to think that... that like, for, for a while, we think that it's true that she must have imagined her daughter still being alive. Because how could no one have seen her daughter? And there'd be no signs of it. So that one bit of, of easily removed ADR is ju just completely ruins the entire concept. Anyway, no more spoilers. The dialogue does a decent job of conveying characterization and exposition. There's not that much of it that's like really quotable, quotable and memorable and certainly very little of it is for is is that in a good way. There's 23 entries in the IMDb quote section. There's there's some that, that can be fun. Like, the villains talk like no one does outside of fiction, which can be fun, but other than that, yeah. Quoting fellow critics, all the best lines are spoken off screen by random extras that only exist in ADR. Some zingers come from any number of stereotypical angry passengers who portray a particular class or race. My favorite was a man in first class who says about a woman looking for her daughter, it's not like she lost her palm pipe. Palm pipe? What year is it? Who wrote that at the turn of the century and then kept it for safekeeping until 2005? As if the char main characters weren't shallow and underdeveloped enough, the filmmakers decided to add some 2D extras just in case. Don't even get me started on the Arabs or the guy with the mustache. The dialogue is repetitive and predictable. 
I just love the post booming Dublin dialogue. The dialogue is incredibly corny, and it would be difficult to find some that is more unoriginal. It just filters every single line from any I lost my kid film and puts it puts them on an airplane. Nameless passengers have the best lines of the movie. Now, this is one of those movies where if you have the option to put on closed captioning, it definitely helps. There are several lines that are difficult to pick up and, and yeah, f figure out exactly what was said if you don't have the closed captioning. Moving on to the cinematography. So it was done by Florian Ballhaus, and let's see. yeah, so the, the movies, the only other movies that I've seen that he was DP on were Red and Did You Hear About the Morgans. Now, I think it was the right choice not to go with handheld, but instead, like, there's, there's handheld, but it's not like shaky cam, it's, it's, uh, what's it called again? Steadicam rig. And yeah, so from Wikipedia, to allow for very cam varied camera angles, the set had many tracks for the camera dog to move, and both the walls and the ceiling were built on hinges so that they could easily easily be swung open for shooting. Quoting Philip Critcher. Everything from the icy blue palette of the cinematography to the icy blue glare of the star speaks to a mood that is somber rather than hyperkinetic. Great cinematography. The cinematography by Florian Dollhouse is impressive and unique. Excellent cinematography. It has its share of unique cinematography with obscure camera angles, like a sideways shot beneath an airplane landing, but other seemingly pointless slow motion shots that don't add much to the scene. Most of that doesn't really take away from the story and the performance of the actors do. Some snazzy camera work and rich cinematography. Cinematography is very solid. Expert cinematography. Robert Schwenke directs the flight plan and Florian Bellhaus is credited with the cinematography. Schwenke is fairly inexperienced, but Bellhaus has worked on movies like Games of New York. I mean, I've seen that. I. I didn't find that when I was looking them up. Anyway, quiz show and Men in Black. Anyway, yeah, I've wa I've watched all the Men in Black movies. The first one definitely has good cinematography. It shows he does a wonderful job of framing the film in soothing airline blues and sharp, sometimes reflective colors. The look of the movie has a lot in common with the clean lines and light reflective colors of some of the films Men in Black. Whatever else it may be, flight plan looks big budget slick. It does have an efficient, costly looking production with sharp and striking cinematography by the talents of Florian Bauhaus. Florian Bauhaus's cinematography is top notch. Direct by Robert Schwenke, flight plan is majority straightforward and glossy, as the picture looks stellar. Cinematography is expertly handled by Florian Bauhaus, son of the legendary cinematographer Michael Bauhaus. Director Robert Schwenke's gracefully gliding cinematography. His cinematography is very in innovative. He's come up with all kinds of interesting angles, shots, and lighting schemes to show the same monotonous location. Elegantly shot, director Schwenke swoops around his giant set with an energetic style that keeps this wide screen, screen film from becoming too claustrophobic. The director keeps the movie from utter pointlessness by keeping the movie visually interesting. The movie's color palette is blue and grays, and the airplane is full of steep curves and surfaces. The camera does all sorts of tricks, like filming the conversation from the outside of the windows, which ultimately does nothing for the story of the movie overall. Director Schwenke's sleek images reveal a bent for weird angles and disorientated viewpoints. I think he is Florian Bauhaus, sort of master cinematography. Yeah, Michael Bauhaus. The camera moving frantically yet stylishly through the mains of this massive aircraft, peeking in and out of every possible hiding place. Wanker uses shadow and what is often a steely lifeless and cold color palette to his advantage and further accentuating the sense of unease, despair, and deception recovered above the story. 
The stone is somewhat similar to and may be removed from the flowing lines. A flowing like moments of gripping suspense and pressing of plot twists. There are also many moments of laughable action or failures of logic in the story. Seeing Jody Foster run in slow motion down the aisle of a large airline intense to the point of bursting is not one of those better moments, and the director doesn't have the decency to keep this to a one-time action sequence, but gives it again. The opening of the film is well done. Foster and Dean do play their roles well. With good support from other members of the cast, there is a sense of gathering attention, heightened by the claustrophobic setting and the film's melancholy look. The action takes place in winter and the flight at night. The predominantly the predominant colors are dark blue, black, gray, and white. The camera work was average and puzzling at times. Finally, the cinematography is pretty excellent. The shots themselves create a nice sense of claustrophobia and are and are all very well done. Twenty thirty well shot camera angles are not enough to save this movie and inspire the least bit of suspense. The widescreen film plays in a muted tone with delicate dotted lighting and an almost whispered delivery. It's an enticing rhythm and one that's brilliant and builds suspense. Now the editing was done by Tom Noble, who yeah, these are the other movies that I've seen that I've watched that he's edited. Red, Rain of Fire, Vertical Limit, and Spectre Gadget, The Mask of Zorro, The Huts of the Prophecy, Thelma Louise, and Fahrenheit 451. Um, yeah, so, according to our critics here, tight editing, editing with excellent editing is wasted. The editing tries to create some sense of claustrophobia, some paranoia, but it fails at that and ends up making the film feel like some trashy B-movie thriller that does anything but thrill. Tom Noble's editing is top-notch. The editing tries to create some sense of claustrophobia, but I, uh, I guess I accidentally copied my name twice. Anyway, that brings us... Yeah, so the special effects, there's at least one CG effect that just does not hold up, and it didn't look that convincing in 2007 either, but largely it doesn't, you know, the, the, thankfully most, you know, the, the plane is, was shot on a set, so they, you know, it's it's not, it's not a, a special, it's not a visual effect. The stunts are perfectly decent. The budget was fifty-five million, and the box office was two hundred twenty-three point four million. So a hit. You know, f four times its budget. Not, you know, uh, obviously. Yeah, production design. Quoting Wikipedia, the art direction team had to build all the interiors and the cockpit of the fictional E-474 from scratch, basing both the interior design and layout on the Airbus A380. It is noted that the amount of dead space within the cabin, cargo, and avionics areas do not reflect the actual amount of dead space within, within any aircraft. The, the aerospace provided various objects to stage the scene. Many of the interior sets used real aircraft components, such as seats, galleys, etc. The design and colors tried to invoke the mood for each scene. For example, a white room for eerie, clinical cold moments, lower ceilings for claustrophobia, and wide open spaces to give more clues to the audience. Most exterior scenes of the E-474 involve a model with one-tenth of the aircraft's actual size, the images being subsequently enhanced with the Current imagery, and yeah, honestly, I I I didn't really notice that too much. That wasn't the the CG effect that I was talking about. Now, this was filmed. Some of it was filmed in Berlin, and let's see, some of it was filmed in California. Yeah. Let's 
so on the tension and suspense and such quoting fellow critics before anything bad happens the movie communicates not only the knowledge that something is going to go wrong but an almost physical anxiety Joseph Foster plays a woman whose husband has just been killed in a freak accident and now she and her daughter have to return with her husband's body to America in her interaction with her daughter there's a subtle undertone the little girl Marine Walston is no longer sure her mother can protect her and her mother isn't sure either neither is the audience Flat plan taps into two primal fears. The obvious one is the fear of losing a child. The second, less obvious, is the fear of flying. Though I'm sure there are other films that do this, this is the only one I can remember that accurately replicates the average experience of being on a commercial airliner. In movies, if a plane isn't in trouble, flights tend to be unrealistically smooth. But in flight plan, air travel is shown to be as nerve-jangling as it is in real life. The overhead compartments rattle as the whole plane shakes. Plane shakes on takeoff and at pr the cruising altitude there are intermittent thumps. The director never lets the viewer forget that flight plan is taking place six miles above the ground in air that is not completely trustworthy. The movie does a decent job with atmosphere, mystery, and paranoia. Now, the scenes are easy to follow, and they're meant to, and I think that's the right decision. This, you know, other than the very, very start, where at first you don't realize that what you're watching is a dream that is heavily influenced by breathing but within a few minutes you realize that that's what is going on now music this the score was handled by James Horner am I really gonna list every single I'm not gonna list every single I, I it's James Horner you know I, I don't have to going to yeah Let's see. the score was very subtle and there wasn't a lot of it either this helped establish and maintain the mood so Wikipedia the score for flight plan was released September 20th 2005 on Hollywood records the music was composed and conducted by James Horner and the disc contains eight tracks Horner stated that the film's score tried to mix the sound effects with the emotion and drive of the music, and the instruments were picked to match the feelings of panic Kyle goes on through the film. These included the game, game on instruments, prepared piano, and string arrangements. No brass instruments are used in the soundtrack. And quoted the film critics. With the little passive virtues, the steely intensity of Joey Foster not standing up to mount, it's not sulfur. Even James Horner's music plays it cool. And the the sound design. Once again, according to all critics, the first thing that you may notice about this film and the last is the soundtrack. It's all pretty quiet. You don't hear the big jet engines screaming, people can speak softly. The only person who shouts is Joey Foster, and then on the screen, Where's My Baby? There's no musical score worth mentioning, but the incidental sounds, wow. If a door aboard the airline closes, or her body falls softly into the carpeted deck, the action is accompanied by a loud lomp on the soundtrack, sometimes with a cowbell or two thrown in. If somebody should be... Sometimes you get wumps for no reason at all, except that there is a cut from one scene to another. There's a little bit of black comedy in the movie. It's n no, it's it's not particularly good. The the comic relief is not particularly good in the movie.
So the yeah, level of realism. This is one of those movies where you really need to suspend disbelief for the villain plan, the laws of physics to apply, but there are there's a there's an absurd amount of contrivances. So yeah, pacing on yeah. Starting by quoting Wikipedia, Schwenke described Flip Plan as a slow boring thriller where the opening is different from the faster ending parts. And quoting from, quoting from the critics, very drawn out, a 25 minute story stretched to 90 plus minutes. The film starts slowly and continues reasonably slowly. This film started off good, but slowed to a crawl in the middle, either in an attempt to be suspenseful or to kill time. Yeah, it definitely has pacing issues. So the movie is an hour, 31 and a half minutes long, without any credits, and an hour and 38 minutes long with them. Is it worth the investment of time? Maybe, maybe once, if, if you, I would say that once they get onto the plane, give it five, maybe ten minutes, if by that, if once that time has passed, if you're not, like, if you're, if you're really invested, stay with the movie, but if you're already getting frustrated, that's when, a lot of people are going to get frustrated, start getting frustrated, then turn the movie off. It's only going to get worse. I think if you stop watching around the one hour mark and then just make up in your own head, make up an ending in your own head, it'll probably be better than what they came up with. There are definitely times where it feels like it's more, it's it's longer than it is. It's not really the kind of movie where you want to fast forward through certain scenes. I think it would be good for it to be shorter. There's just it's it's too repetitive. So the, the best element of the film is, yeah, see, see, let's see. There's two options. If you watch the entire movie, the best part is picking apart all the plot holes. But if you, if you only watch the first hour or so, I would say that the, the anxiety, the tension, and you, you, you know, if you share Kyle's anxiety, then that's really effective. The worst aspect is the absurd plot twist. And, you know, if you go into the movie knowing that that's going to be the case and you lower your expectations, that's... Yeah, you know, that that is the... That's, that's a good way to, to make it sting less, but, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to just stop watching around the one hour mark. And I do think that it's a very big problem for the movie. Now, according to others other than the, the sort of plot twist. The worst aspect is that it wastes talented actors, which is definitely frustrating. I don't think it's a, a really big deal though. I, I get why it is others. 
the thing I was most worried about going into the movie was that Julia's disappearance wouldn't make sense and the movie lived down to my expectations. I was most looking forward to the sheer tension of the concept of, you know, losing a child and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now, for a lot of the movie, the movie is legitimately effective as the, you know, tension suspense thing. Now, it has some, it's a movie that has some good parts, especially before the plot twists. So again, the first hour or so. But on, as a whole, I can't really claim that it's a good movie. Now, it is a movie that tries to give answers to mysteries. There's there's still stuff that you can't really claim has been answered by the end, but some attempt was, was made. The trailer gives away too much. The, the 2 minute 25 second trailer, I, I wasn't able to find any other trailer for it, but you know, hypothetically, if you're watching this in the future, there's like a fan trailer. I don't know. But the, the 2 minute 25 trailer, like, you want to stop watching it either 57 seconds in or a minute and 40 seconds in. But if you watch past a minute and 40 seconds, like, it spoils something that's revealed very close to the end of the movie. It does represent the... It, the, the, movie, the trailer does give you a good idea of what the movie's like. If you like the trailer, you'll like the movie. If you don't like the trailer, you won't like the movie. And, you know, if you watch the entire trailer with all the spoilers, it really does give you an idea of the whole thing. For, yeah. Now... The cover and poster don't give away too much. I'm not sure that I would say that they give a good idea give you a good idea of what it's like. I don't know. I it's it's kind of difficult with this movie. Now the movie does not have a lot of metaphors to film on elements, a lot of depth for stuff to analyze. You don't need to watch it more than once to understand it. You know, basically, all you need to know before going into this movie to, in order to fully appreciate it, is post 9-11 flying, you know, rules and such. Now, I already mentioned that the movie plays on post-9-11 anxieties, which makes it weird that part of the part of the movie is that nobody remembers Julia, or, or part of the reason why nobody remembers Julia is that she and Kyle boarded the plane before anyone else. The script was originally written for 9-11, Back then, you could maybe do that, but like after 9 11, yeah. I mean, she's not, it's not like, oh, you know, oh, say she has a small child. Other, there, there are several other small children on the plane that, you know, they, they didn't get to go on before Kyle and Julian did. So, I, I, I mean, I guess the idea is supposed to be that. You know, they're let on so early because they are clearly grieving and, and sad. But it still doesn't really make sense in a post-9-11 flying rules and regulations world. Basically, this probably would have been better as an episode of The Twilight Zone. And 
I'm, to be fair, I will say it does a decent job of providing a movie that is like, what's the word? Given that the given that so much of the movie is essentially padding, you don't you don't fully realize as you're watching just how much of it is padding. It's it's only really when you think back you realize I I, I would argue at least that a lot of the padding I I didn't realize when I was watching the movie just how bad it was, but yeah, so, so the, um, what's the word? They do a decent job of hiding that, actually, but the concepts, there's enough there for an episode of, like, Twilight Zone or Outer Limits, but there's not enough for an entire movie. You know, this is in contrast to Red Eye, which has, has incredible pacing, and really does do an incredible job of just like once once the you know it, it takes a while to build to the key concept it doesn't just spring it on you the way that this kind of does and once the the key concept is in place then it explores that in basically every like yeah it, it's it's not a spoiler we'll to say that that's a movie about a young woman, Lisa Reiser, who is basically forced to, she's coerced into to doing something she really doesn't want to from, you know, in, in a plane, uh, using the, the in-flight phone. And she's, she tries to get out of having to do this, and she basically, like, comes up with every single, anything that she could do she she comes up with it and then she tries to carry it out and I'm not gonna spoil whether or not you know whether any of it works but it's a movie where like I I've watched it many times and I've watched it with other people and I've never heard you know I never leave the movie thinking well why didn't she just do that and the people I've watched it with also, I, I have you know, and that's that can be a big problem in a in a thriller, is like, well, why why doesn't the character just try doing this? You know, I I don't know, maybe it wouldn't work, but why don't they just try it though? And and this movie, way too much of it is just Kyle trying to convince, like like. First, Kyle goes to, to you know, first first she looks by herself. Then she talks, then she asks, like, a flight attendant, can you help me look? And they're like, okay, I guess we'll, we'll go this high up as intensity as far as looking. And then she's like, I don't know, can't you go this high up? And they're like, okay, fine, fine. We don't want to, but we'll go up here. I want you to go up here. And they just keep, and eventually... They just say no. You know what? We're not gonna inc we're not gonna look even harder than we already have. You know, we don't believe that she was ever on the plane. And yeah, it's just it it doesn't. If if you have like this sinking feeling in your stomach of like something bad's gonna happen to this six year old, you know, then it really works. But if you're sitting and you're like. It, it can really feel tedious if yeah and and if the if it was only it was like if it only had to feel like 42 minutes of you know air time of a TV show instead of get itself to almost 90 minutes yeah or what, what was it just over 90 minutes anyway I have some suggestions for how to fix this movie and I, um, I'm going to go into them at the very start of the notes taken before watching section. And I also have a list, probably long list, of big problems with the movie The Plot Holes that I can only detail by going into spoilers, and I'll be doing so 
I haven't decided yet if it's going to be the notes taken before watching or the notes taken while watching. It probably before watching it. That's probably where I'm going to be. And when I searched on YouTube for videos about this movie, I found almost nothing. Like, almost every video that popped up was actually about flight plans and, and such. You know, I found a trailer, a minute and a half of behind the scenes, and then a review. But instead of review, he the, the uploader called it Note on Flight Plan. And... On Rotten Tomatoes, this has 37% based on 179 reviews and a 48% based on 250,000 audience ratings, or more than, yeah. And the critics' consensus is the factors are all on key here, but as the movie progresses, tension deflates as the far-fetched plot kicks in. On Metacritic, it has 53 out of 100 and the user rating is 5.6 out of 10 with user reviews as recent as May 29th of this year 33 Metacritic reviews, 62 Metacritic user reviews and on IMDb it has 6.3 out of 10 and 646 IMDb user reviews and in IMDb's external review section, there are 218 links. I was able to get 81 of them to work. But yeah, you know, a, that that kind of rating makes makes good sense. Somewhere around five, maybe six. There's not a lot of violence in this, and almost all of it is is mild, at least in what is shown, not like what actually happens should be more than mildly violent, but it's only implied basically, PG-13. And yeah, so I basically already said, but just to make it completely clear, this is not capital C cinema, this is basically junk food. Now, let's see, who do I recommend it to? If, if you're a big fan of the kind of child in peril tension and suspense thing. You know, again, I would say watch the first hour and then stop watching, but yeah. Now, on Disney Plus, it doesn't have any extras. Well, comparatively, most MCU movies have good stuff and some of them have a ton of stuff. But yeah, if, you know, if, if you're looking for a place that streams this, Disney Plus at least streams it via, via Star. So, so, actually, yeah, I guess it's possible that even if it wasn't on Star, it would still not really edit stuff down. But, you know, if, if you use Star, so, some of the movies on Disney Plus, on Star, you know, some of those gory movies, you know, I, I think they have all, every movie in the Alien series, you know, including Prometheus and Covenant. So, unbelievably gory stuff there, and I haven't watched all of them, but I should, I've watched a lot, let's see, I watched some of the first one, and as far as I could tell, they didn't get rid of anything, you know, chest bursting, and, yeah. Now... I give this five suddenly missing children out of ten, and if the last thirty minutes were significantly better, it could have been six, possibly as high as seven. 
And that, wow, I spent way longer on the review than most recent ones. Anyway, that brings us to the spoiler section. Thought section start. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mind is being varied. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I also try to talk very fast during the disclaimers. Since a lot of it is very standard information, I might keep speaking as fast as to sometimes do during the section. Once I get into the rest of the video itself, with that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of me may be in this section. Honestly, obviously I don't want a sequel to this. That's not that's not gonna surprise anyone. I wouldn't hate like a spiritual successor as long as they got it right. Like I already mentioned the the you know, I I think it would be a better Twilight Zone episode. I think if it were like a Twilight Zone episode and then you know, there at the end, I, yeah, I think once Kyle starts really freaking out, the air marshal, you know, like, yeah, like, yeah, the air marshal draws his gun, she panics and tries to lunge at him, but he manages to shoot her before, before she comes close, and then, like, maybe the, the passengers on the plane get like real like they, they they start saying you murdered her how could you do that and he's like no, no i i have to defend myself and some of them like get out of their seats and grab him get his gun away and like you know stuff like that maybe actually yeah maybe it keeps escalating and escalating and actually yeah you know what it should like a really epic way to end it would be that like one of the some someone runs up to the 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 door leading into the pilot is in like a, a panic and like bangs on the door and and the door gets opened and like a gun gets discharged accidentally and kills the pilot who collapses like forward onto the if if you imagine this is like the what what do they call the the steering thing so he just presses it down and the plane crashes, explodes, everyone dies. And then like it cuts to like a display screen showing the explosion. And we see that it's like aliens or maybe like the US military or something. And they say, well, you know, it, at, as expected, if you, if, if, someone who's already grieving has their child disappear and no one will help them and they seem to not be able to find the child the situation is going to escalate you know and if it's US military they're going to be like okay we got to figure out how do we prevent this from happening and if it's aliens they're like great that this is our this is this is our plan for you know disabling like yeah, for, for, this is how we're going to destabilize or something. But as it is, with without any kind of, like, actually, actually, yeah, I guess it does kind of need to be aliens or something. I re the, the moment that you try to explain it without saying that something that clearly just, it, it you have to use, you have to make the explanation admit that it couldn't happen without, for example, aliens or something supernatural. That's... And any anything else, it's just going to be ridiculous. And it is. Now, I am only spoiling this movie in the rest of this video. If, if I spoil anything else, I will verbally warn before I do so. And hold up an index finger as I'm spoiling, you know, before and as I'm spoiling, so you can mute and skip ahead and choose me lower my index finger. So let's see. Instead of me quoting all the lines that 
I found really ridiculous from this movie. Yeah, you know, most of the most of the ones in the IMDb quote section were pretty ridiculous. So instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. So the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of well thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MST MST3 gay with five other jokes. Especially jokes in the thoughts that I had while watching section. Time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I had while while watching. In chronological order, the video was a running commentary line tweeting or like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. My making jokes in this should not necessarily be taken as me wanting to make light of the subject. I simply find it very difficult to answer MC3K and overanalyze everything I watch. And that brings us to notes taken while watching. We did all we could, but there was some trauma to your husband's head from the fall. There was? It sure isn't showing up on screen right now. I get that they can't show that kind of thing in PG-13, but then maybe don't have a line like that if you're also going to show his face like that. It's just, all they, all they had to do was... Like literally, if the line hadn't been there, but but the moment that the line is there, I'm like I'm I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out what is he talking about? There's no there's no trauma there, and yeah, just I I mean I can only imagine that that line was written when they thought the movie was gonna be an R rating, and it was gonna be like grisly and and get the audience to immediately feel like feel like something dangerous is going to happen in this movie or something, but anyway. If you watch this movie without closed captioning, you might miss that when it smash cuts to Kyle at the airport, we apparently hear hubbub. I wasn't aware anybody still used that word. Kyle doesn't apologize to the Arabs later on, and she also doesn't apologize to her daughter for yelling at her you know, when when Julia is suddenly, yeah, Ju Julia suddenly isn't there, she goes over and she really berates her. She's just totally unapologetic, and I I I I get that it is this sort of thing of like we're seeing how afraid Kyle is of losing Julia, but why is Julia walking away? Like, I guess maybe it, it goes with that thing of, you know, Julia isn't sure that Kyle can protect her any longer. But walking off like that also doesn't... Yeah, anyway. They're not going to fall, but they could, just like Dad did. Kyle looks at the spoilt children who take the seat in front of her. If those kids never go missing, they're too loud. It's okay to hate the passengers. I guess that's supposed to be why they show so little empathy towards Kyle when Julia goes missing. They've experienced too many spoiled children on these flights. Parents of the spoiled children wonder what the de-icing is about, and like one of them, I, I forget, I think it's the wife, she's like scared. She's like, what is going on, you know? And the moment it showed Kyle's face, we can tell that she knows what it's for. For like a second, I thought she was going to be a halfway decent person and like lean over. Like, if, if you haven't watched the movie in a while, like, they're... 
they're super close to each other. If she leans over, she doesn't even have to raise her voice to talk to them. You know, she, they, yeah, I thought she was going to be a decent person actually tell them so they don't worry. But no, she's only going to tell Julia. It's not as though she, can, she, she can't do both. She could tell Julia and also Ben. The whole thing with Carson being undercover is pretty silly. They keep making sure we notice that he's there because he's complaining about the school children, he's complaining about the movie not being funny, which, I mean, yeah, it, it definitely isn't funny. And Kyle try, goes to try to go past the flight attendant serving drinks, but is asked to go around. The male flight attendant offers a passenger some juice, saying, Your juice? And I just wish the person responded, Thanks, but next time don't squeeze me so hard. No, I never saw her. That is to say, I've never seen her. All children should have to wear a cowbell. It's not going to protect their toes. She's not herself right now. Okay, who is she then? Turn around, bright eyes. We don't have a record of your daughter ever being on board. We check every LP, both sides. Someone has her. Can you think of anything else? Please, try hard. This movie desperately needs better writing than that. Did you tell him about the bear? Bear. Have you been drinking? I'm pretty sure she meant a teddy bear. She's not saying there must be a grizzly on board, dude. That, that, was, that was an enormous leap. Like, the Olympics, I don't really pay attention. I... I I think they're going on right now. I don't think they already have ended. I think Sean Bean should should enter because that has to be an Olympic record for a a logical leap, a, a jump to a conclusion like that is wow. How did like holy crap a teddy bear does not constitute an inaccurate flight manifest. As I mentioned earlier in this video, I watched this 14 years ago and not one day has gone by where I haven't tried my hardest to find some way to work that line of dialogue into conversation. I don't see what all the fuss is about. It's not like she lost her palm pilot. What an utterly ridiculous thing to say. Of course not. Palm pilots can't walk. I'm running out of magazines up here. I have a fear of flying, and building a fort out of magazines calms me down. Like, I literally don't even... What? How many magazines do you need to last through, like... Anyway. Do I know you from somewhere? You walked past me five times since we took off. Does that count? Are you from Berlin? Are we playing questions only right now? My daughter. You were looking for my daughter. Well, she's definitely neither down my pants or up her skirt. She looked very carefully. You've got to search the holes now. I'm sorry, Hal. I can't let you do that. We're going to continue to search this plane from the waist up. Well, there's two flight attendants in this room that are not good at keeping things above the waist. Maybe they could go? I know where I've seen him before, and Kyle Pratt, Kyle Pratt goes Jack Bauer. When I travel with my children, I have an eye on them at all times. I don't lose them and blame somebody else. I guess that line is supposed to be why he seems to forgive her later, that he felt like that was out of line. Obviously someone from the crew is involved. 
Jesus. I think he's in on this. He does pull disappearing axe. What's he doing? What's he doing? Okay, hold on one second. Are you telling me that the guy who explicitly, repeatedly said that he doesn't believe it, believe her, is acting like he doesn't believe her? You're crazy. You're all crazy. Now, can someone please stop the camera from spinning around me? It's freaking me out. That one female flight attendant, I, I think it's the one who's in on it with Carson, has her eyes, like, incredibly wide open. I guess she's trying to make up for how uh, Carson's eyes are barely open. The actress playing the therapist is way too good for this movie. Her acting, the writing they did for her. She said she couldn't sleep. She'll barely wake up by the end of this movie, so evidently she got over that. I could 100% respect if this movie really was about someone who was grieving the loss. The, yeah, if, if Kyle was grieving the loss of both of them, and because of that she was... You know, she was having problems coping with that loss. Although, obviously, it should be significantly... It, it shouldn't... She shouldn't be running around shouting her name and such. But, yeah. I don't want to give the movie too much credit. Because, apparently, they stole it from the Hitchcock movie. But the idea of the heart being there... Not being how she realizes that Julia was there... Does work. Because we were told, specifically... No one was in that seat. So it's not that somebody else was there and drew the heart. So it is a very strong piece of evidence that Julia was there. A little under an hour into the movie and Kyle climbs into the bench. Nobody will be seated during the psychological thriller turns into Die Hard segment of the movie. So first, she, you know, she, she starts fiddling with the plugs. First, she releases the air masks, and then she cut the power. You can put down the mask. We haven't lost pressure. I don't know. I don't think either of you have been feeling any pressure to give a decent acting performance. Although today, with Corona, that line kind of plays like, I guess he's an anti-masker. And Kyle breaks the windshield of the car. Fun fact, if it's an American movie and there is at least one car in the movie, at least one car has to take at least some damage. It's the law. Turn around, blind eyes. So, we see that Carson gets the explosion. Yeah. We see a little later that Carson gets the explosives out of the coffin. What were they going to do if Kyle shut the coffin and locked it before they got, in, got there? Or shut it and locked it before she went back with Carson? Or like, let's see, what if... Or, or if she just never opened it? Because why would she? I, I, I have no idea why she opened it. What, there's obviously not room for both her both her husband and Julia in there. Did she think that Julia somehow knew the code and unlocked it and removed the body and moved it to where Kyle can't see it from standing? You know, hypothetically, let's say that someone took the body out of the coffin. It's, it's clearly not, like, right outside the coffin. Like, it would have to have been moved... Yeah. Let's see. Kyle starts poking holes in, in the plot, and Carson just goes, I don't know, and I don't care. So he's clearly channeling the screenwriter there. Are you hurt? Did you eat anything? If she ate airplane food, she definitely got hurt. Julia sleeps through almost the entire movie, which is, which means she represents about 20% of the audience. I've never heard of terrorists letting passengers deboard before. 
I'd like to say that that's the movie having enough self-awareness to criticize itself, but honestly, it's probably more than it's patting itself on the back and being clever and original. Hasn't this been explained to you a thousand times? It has, and it never gets any less stupid. Carson goes back to Kyle and claims to her that they do believe her, and there's an FBI missing person unit you know, waiting for I mean, for sure, if anyone can find Julia, it's Jack, Sam, Danny, and Vivian. Elena can come too, I guess. And all the passengers leave the plane, including discount Paul Blart and all cop. Carson thinks he's very clever, but he still can't prevent Kyle from running, and the captain talks to Kyle, and it's you know, she realizes he thinks she's the terrorist, and, you know, she realizes that means that Carson has been lying. Carson, you get off the plane when I say you get off the plane. So she's playing the part. Clever. If he wasn't reaching for the detonator, why did he put his hand in his pocket? You want to play? Let's play. No, 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 you watch a Let's Play. You don't play a Let's Play. And Kyle grabs the detonator and leaves Carson with a written note. Now I have a detonator. Ho, ho, ho. You're taking things too personally. She's not a kleptomaniac. They're always taking things literally. The harder this gets, the more he seems to enjoy himself. I'm very tempted to make a sex joke here, but I just can't help but notice every single time we're seeing Carson here near the end of the film, he does not look like he's enjoying himself at all. Like, was that line written for early in the movie and got moved or something? And, you know, Kyle finds Julia and she's, you know, I mean, I'll grant that she doesn't try super hard to wake her up, but she just, she notices that, you know, oh, she's, she's like, fast asleep. And she's like, my god, what did they do to you? I'm going to go with horse tranquilizer. People will think what I tell them to think when you tell me what to tell them to think. That is an incredible fireball explosion. Like, that, that really, like, several critics said that it, you know, the climax was like, a Jean-Claude Van Damme or Steven Seagal movie. Yeah, for sure, especially with that fireball. That was ridiculous. Good things that good thing that the avionics engineer could tell from looking at the explosives that they wouldn't kill her because she closed the door. I, what one critic pointed out, no, 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 it's okay. She had a little bit of soot on her. So clearly, you know, no, 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 this woman was definitely in an explosion recently. She looks like you. She's asleep. How could you possibly tell that she's panicked and obsessive? I could have sworn that there was like a flashback or something showing Julia being stuffed into one of those food transport carts. I guess I just read that as a theory and like misremembered. And Kyle and Julia strap on their seatbelts in the back of the FBI car and are driven right into a white fade, which means either a lobotomy or heaven, and honestly, right now, I could go for either, or both. I feel like the climax is in this unfortunate middle ground. It's not exciting enough to be satisfying, but it also does go past what we believe Kyle could do. You know, once I, I have no idea how she was so certain that the explosives wouldn't hurt her and Julia when it was that close. You could easily have had it be that she shot him in self-defense. I think actually that, I, I, that, I remembered it as being that, or, or maybe I remembered it, actually, no, yeah, I think I remembered it as the last thing she does to him is hit him in the face with the, the, what's it called? Fire extinguisher. But, no, absolutely had to, or at least that she would be further away from the explosion, like, yeah. Let's 
So that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. I mentioned in the review that I have a suggestion for how to fix the movie. The biggest problem with the movie, and the one that I intend to address, is the fact that the plan is ridiculous and relies on a ton of coincidences and sheer luck. Here's how I fix it. It wasn't the original plan. Which we know for a fact that it was, because Carson specifically says, hasn't this been explained to you a thousand times? So, you know, once again, super easy fix. Once she says, I don't know about this, instead of him saying, we've gone over it a thousand times, have him say, I know it didn't go according to plan, but I think we can still make it work. But yeah. It wasn't the original plan. It was 100% them making it up as they went along, hoping that it would work, and it almost did. I'm not going to claim that I know exactly how you do that, but it would probably be something like that originally they were planning to target a different passenger, maybe someone who was supposed to get on the plane before Kyle did, but then someone took one look at Kyle and Julian and said, they're so sad, they need a break. I'm going to let them on the plane first. An argument could be made that the movie needs for that person the person making that decision to be in on the plan, so sure, they are. But they have too much empathy for the job, and that's why they let Kyle and Julia on first. And when the original plan is explained, it should be something that is completely watertight. So, the following doesn't connect to what I just said. This is if you want something other than that. I think the idea that nobody saw the kid thing, it should have been that some people maybe thought they saw the kid, but then, like, Carson talks to them and makes, it, makes them doubt it enough that they end up saying they didn't see a kid there. Like, okay, so this is a completely different thing, but I'm thinking something along the lines of, like, 12 Angry Men. And I mean the original, I forget, 53? I haven't seen any of the other versions. The way that gradually, you know, they discuss... But if this, then what about that? And like gradually over the course of it, more and more of the jury members agree, maybe the kid, maybe I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure anymore that this kid did murder his father, you know. Have it be something like that. I saw a fellow critic say that this was supposed to comment on the Patriot Act and how weird too eager to believe when someone in authority tells us something. And yeah, you know, Carson says, when I tell people will believe what I tell them to believe because I have authority. I can kind of see that in the film. So that's supposed to be why they think that there wasn't a kid because the people in authority say that there wasn't one. But I, I just don't think that it, it's not enough. It doesn't completely work. Maybe if Kyle was very distinctly belonging to a group of people that people don't like to support, so they would feel like if they agree with, that they saw her child, they would be supporting her. Like, if she seemed really racist, but then, no, someone would have said it before she interrogates the Arab. I guess it's possible that's what they were going for with, with the family. And, and actually, you know, if, yeah, another option is that's why she's so panicked and anxious. Basically, the passengers on the plane think she's mentally ill. And they don't want to be seen as enablers. Several of these things could have worked, but the movie doesn't quite know how to play it. I, I understand, like, this was one of the first movies that Schwenke did. Or, yeah, yeah, directed. So, I don't blame him for not quite having the chops to do it right, but I do think that he should have had the self-awareness to admit, I'm not the right person for this. You need someone who's more adept. You know, see, this is where you can really tell the difference. I, I think Wes Craven could probably have made this movie work like he made Red Eye work. Red Eye shouldn't work. The, the idea is ridiculous but he makes it work because he knows how to scare people he knows how to make people think 
you know, very specific fear-based things, and Schwenke doesn't really, so it just doesn't, at, at least not by this point, or at least not well enough that he can make that work. Now, let's see. So yeah, the early in the movie, Kyle racially profiles the two Arabs. Thankfully, it turns out they're completely innocent, which I really appreciate because, you know, in reality, it is much more likely to be a white guy doing terrorism than a Middle Eastern looking Muslim. But then she never actually apologizes to the Muslims. And there at the end, when they see that she really was missing her daughters, almost like they forgive her. Like the, the guy that she, the guy that responded to her when she, you know, hands her the, the bag. As if her racially profiling them is acceptable because she really was missing a child. Like, and you, again, if what it was was that she went a little over the top like she she felt that like let's say that she she yelled let, let's say the thing she was being forgiven for was yelling at the staff because at first she talks to them at, at a completely reasonable volume but they they keep not listening to her and they interrupt her as she's trying to explain and so she, she snaps and, and yells at one of them. And then later, yeah, actually, yeah, and, and then immediately apologizes. And then later when they see that she really was missing a child, then they could say, I'm sorry we didn't take it more seriously or something like that. But racial profiling is a huge problem. I'm, I'm going to quote a fellow critic here. The stereotyping of Arabs is too important an issue to assign to the few scenes allocated in this movie. This issue would have been better served with these scenes on the editing room floor. They were obviously forced into the plot to reveal how easily we engage in stereotypical behavior. If I were an Arab, these scenes would cause me to leave the theater, feeling as though the dangerous harassment I often experience could be easily eradicated if I offered the offender their purse. Either deal with the issue in an informative, intriguing manner, or let another film bring it to life. This feeble attempt still left me wondering if they, an often dangerous word, were still connected to the abduction. I don't like the movie The Forgotten. The twist there is really stupid, not to mention unbelievably obvious. But at least that movie, in that movie, that the twist does explain how, not really why, but how they were able to do these seemingly impossible things where this movie expects you to accept that somehow the plan worked out even though there's no indication that these few terrorists demanding money are anything more than completely normal human beings. I mean, let's say that some of them had like psychic powers so they could erase people's memories of seeing a little girl. Obviously, that means that the movie is not set in reality, but at least it's an explanation. I forget if I... did I... Yeah, I, I don't think I already said this. Why does Kyle think Julia is in the coffin if the coffin can only be unlocked by a code that only Kyle knows? Let's see. It... it I guess it, yeah, it is after she's been told that Julia was dead, but it wouldn't, the, the idea that they would both be in the same coffin makes no sense from the size of the coffin. And then, like, she, she opens it, and then she, she kind of talks to, was her, was his name David, maybe, as if she thinks that he can hear her, which, obviously, it's not that she really does believe that, but the um, ah, what's the word? Um, you know, it, I I get what they they're going for this sort of thing of like she's trying to find the strength and he gives her strength, but yeah, it's just that element. 
could have worked, but the movie would have had to be like it works at the very start of the movie, but by that point in the movie, yeah. Let's see. So, yeah, I already mentioned the you know the association of professional flight attendants called an official boycott. You know, the the thing I didn't mention was that in diff you know, they say the movie depicts flight attendants as rude, uncaring, indifferent, and even one as a terrorist. That's yeah. A one half scale set of the avionics area was constructed to make the explosion and fireball look bigger. It worked. Let's see. So all yeah, so this is also from Wikipedia. It was, yeah, Peter A. Dowling had the idea for flight plan in 1999, so before 9-11, and, and originally it was a man and his son, and the flight was from the U.S. to Hong Kong. years later, Billy Ray took over the script, taking out the terrorists from the story, putting and putting more emphasis on the protagonist, who became, who became a female, as Grazer thought it would be a good role for Jodie Foster. The story then focused on the main character regaining her psyche and added the post-September 11th attacks, tension, and paranoia. But there was also an attempt to hide the identity of the villain by showcasing the different characters on the plane. And IMDb trivia points out Sean Bean, contrary to his film history of dying, actually survives. One of the few movies he does not perish. I would add he also isn't a bad guy, despite how often he plays that. Early in the movie, he, we figure he's the villain, and the movie will end with Kyle, ki with Kyle killing him to win. And, you know, we, we can't wait for that. That's going to be so, you know, so satisfying to watch. Depending on whose review you read, Carson demands 50,000, 10 million, or 50 million. I don't know. I guess it's possible I wouldn't have been able to tell for sure without subtitles, but the subtitles certainly said 50 million. And quoting Bill Ackerd here, was the daughter supposed to be drugged? She was as lively as a leech. Seriously. So that's yeah. So far, I haven't talked about very many of the spoiler. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the plot holes that that I can only talk about now that we're in the spoiler sections. For one thing, if even one other person on the flight, if 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 anyone other than Carson, the the female flight attendant who was working with him, and Kyle, believed that there was a child on board, then the movie doesn't work. Like literally, just one person legitimately feeling like, no, I saw her child. The child must be somewhere on board then the movie doesn't work. It, it, you know, even, even if you want to say, oh, but what about the, the call to the morgue? But actually, a lot of people's eyewitness testimony, they get more defense, they, they get defensive and more, like, insistent upon it if someone else tells them something that disproves it. So that doesn't work at all. I, th I think... Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it's possible that I just missed it this time. Maybe it was just said, not shown. But the, yeah, I, I think the idea is supposed to be something like that. They stuffed the the child into like, food delivery cart, while she was sleeping. 
what if she or Kyle woke up as that was happening? How did they get the the boarding pass, which must have been, like, I don't know anyone who would let a six-year-old carry their own boarding pass. Every single person that I've ever met that would transport their six-year-old would hold on to the six-year-old boarding pass themselves, just in case. You know, there's no good reason to, to not... How would they even know where Kyle had it? What if, like, what if she put it in, like, her, her pants pocket on the back of her pants and she was literally sitting on it? Like, how far are they willing to go to, to, it, it just, no, nah, yeah. That, you wouldn't be able to do that, obviously, without her waking up. What if she didn't wake up? What if she was so on edge that, or at least, what, wait, what if she didn't fall asleep? What if she was so on edge that she didn't fall asleep until way later? And a bunch of other passengers did see the kid. What if she didn't... I, yeah, I already mentioned what she didn't... Um, you know, the, the coffin... Why did they need to be real explosives? I guess... Oh, right, right. He did say, we're going to leave her... We're going to blow up the place. The detonator is going to be in her hand. Yeah, it just, I guess, to, to, uh, what's it called? Oh, I guess the idea is supposed to be, hypothetically, if there wasn't any explosives, then why was Carson so sure that there were explosives? Like, the idea is supposed to be that he, he can say with certainty that she told him where the explosives were, he saw them with his own eyes. So if there were no explosives, he wouldn't be able to get away with that, I guess. Let's see, what other... Yeah, if Julia wakes up and, like, yells out, the, the place that she was, I'm pretty sure at least someone would have heard her. Holy crap, like, she, she was lying on the, on the floor of one place, they they had all that turbulence like there's no way that she didn't like that's that's why they kept saying up oh, you know fasten seatbelt you have to stay in your seat there's no way that she always remained completely on the ground she must have been there's it it makes no sense that she was just completely out and didn't wake up at all let's see then there's the I know there's at least some other plot holes. Let's see. Yeah, so, someone pointed out, you know, what, once Kyle was standing in the... Or actually, yeah, wait. Yeah, I was going to say, why, why didn't... You know, someone in the FBI take a shot at Kyle when she was standing there. But then Carson had told them that she wasn't the one who had the detonator. I guess that's supposed to be why that is. Yeah, that, that, you know, I'm not sure it would go that way in real life. But I can see how, you know, it, it just barely, like, as a movie rule thing works out. Let's see. The the organizing of all of this is ridiculous. Like, okay, so the guy who works at the morgue is the one who put the explosives in the coffin, apparently. And like the the yeah, we're never given any explanation as to how... Okay, how did they kill her husband by him falling off the roof of the building without there being obvious footprints in the snow? Like, it's the kind of thing that would be treated as a potential murder 
So there, there would be, you know, police would look at, at it just, it makes no sense. And, and they didn't even have to, they didn't have to set it during winter. They could have set it in like summer when there wouldn't be any, the reason that it's set in winter is because they want the, this, this like icy blue kind of color scheme. They wanted that to be organic. That's the only reason. And it complete like, to be fair, this is not the only movie that I'm aware of where they claim that there was a murder by someone pushing someone else off the top of a roof. Although in that other movie, the, someone did figure it out based on like footprints in the snow. But like, but I think that one also like they barely left any footprints. But it's just it's so ridiculous. How could they be sure that the plane that she took home would be the one where Carson gets to where where Carson is the the air marshal and where the the f you know female flight attendant is the one is is a flight attendant on like it's not like he can just pick and choose as a like he, they get assigned to things like that you know and and certainly it would raise suspicion if they were like oh yeah yeah that one with the with the corpse on it I want to go on that one and then later they're like so I'm I'm talking to, I'm talking to this one this one passenger they're a terrorist and they say that the coffin that like it would raise red flags you know people would notice oh hey that guy actually said that he specifically wanted to be on this plane you know he chose himself that it would let's see then there's the yeah, and they must have had, like, accomplices working the computers, too, because obviously Julia was processed as being on the plane. She wouldn't get to go on the plane without being processed. It's just, why didn't they just set the story before 9-11? Or set it in, like, a dream world where they can, you know, pretend like some of the rules don't complete... Like, it's just, it's complete nonsense. It makes no sense at all that all of these things <sighs> let's see the um, that might more or less be all of the oh right right and and some people pointed out like apparently according to this movie the FBI has jurisdiction in Canada because it's the FBI that are standing there when when the plane lands in Canada and there's a terrorist situation. Like, I don't know what they're called personally, but obviously Canada has their own people for that kind of thing. It's just, it's, it's this ridiculous ethnocentric idea of like, oh, you know, I'm a white American, so everywhere in the world white Americans call the shots. So, you know, oh, it's it's a, it, there's a terrorist on a flight. FBI. It's gotta be the FBI. Like, it, it makes no sense. And then there at the end they say they have an, that the FBI have an office in Germany. I'm not 100% certain if that one is like, I'm, I'm, I'm less certain about that one. I, I still don't think that's a thing. It's just, it's like, why not just choose an international service? Like, the FBI is specific. Like, even the, even the CIA would make more sense. Because the CIA deals with stuff outside of U.S. borders. You know, they don't deal with... It, it wouldn't be them either. But at least you accounted for the fact that it's not in the, in the U.S. It just, it makes zero sense. I think that might be, there's probably other stuff, but, you know, this, yeah, I, I, I think I'm gonna, I, I don't have anything else written down for that, so, yeah. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell, there should be a link to 
my main channel page and one or two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. Currently, the, these videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. Check out my back catalog, catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, and as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.